Thanks, Stan. Um, <clears throat> we come to the next portion of our briefing or our, our meeting, which is the Webb Lecture. Uh, and so the Webb Lecture program honors James E. Webb, uh, one of the founders of the Academy. Mr. Webb's career capped by his exemplary contributions as the director of the Bureau of the Budget and the administrator of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration serves as a standard for those who want to improve and strengthen the capacities and performance of government. The lecture program is sponsored by the Academy's Fund for Excellence in Public, in, uh, Public Administration through a generous grant from the Kerr Foundation. Now I'm going to introduce our introducer. Uh, many of you know Jim Williams. Jim has 39 plus years of successful public and private sector experience, including 30 years in the U.S. federal government and over 18 years as a federal senior executive. He was the U.S. General Service Administration's acting administrator under President George W. Bush and GSA's first Federal Acquisition Services Commissioner. Mr. Williams was also the first director of the U.S. Department of Homeland Security's U.S. Visit Program, which was successfully implemented at DHS to track the entry of foreign visitors with biometrics after 9-11. Earlier, Jim was the Internal Revenue Services leader of their Procurement and Program Management Organization and co-chair of their Shared Services Design Team. Want to stop there? Yeah. Well, I, I have one more thing. He's had, he has received numerous awards, including two presidential rank awards and four Federal Computer Week Fed 100 awards, but he was also a winner of the inaugural Teddy Award for sponsorship. So, Jim, over to you. Well, thank you, Terry, and good morning, everyone. And it's an honor to be here today as a fellow and to be up on stage with, with somebody. Uh, I think for those of you who have waited here, you're really going to enjoy this. Uh, I get to introduce Ann Rung, a friend and somebody who is super smart, super experienced, and a delight to work with on any topic. We just found out we're both rescue dog lovers, very much so. So Ann was the chief acquisition officer for three years for President Obama. That means she was the top acquisition official in government as the administrator of the Office of Federal Procurement Policy at OMB. She's also been the chief acquisition officer at GSA, a central buying agency. She's also been the chief acquisition officer at Department of Commerce. She also has Hill experience on, I believe, the House Judiciary Committee. She's also worked at the state level as the Deputy Secretary for Procurement in the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, she is now the Director of Amazon Business, lives in Seattle, but very much connected to Washington, D.C. And I will tell you, she is just incredible to work with on any topic. And what we're going to do here today, Ann's going to talk for a while, and then I'm going to talk to her. Uh, but please join me in welcoming Ann Rung. Thank you, Jim, and thanks to Teresa for inviting me here today. I really miss introducing myself as uh, Ann Rung, head of OFPP within OMB, within the EOP, within GOV, <laughs> and people being super impressed, but that has since gone now that I'm at Amazon, I just get blank stares. Um, <laughs> I also want to thank many of my colleagues and friends here today who I spoke to in preparation for today, including uh, Stan Soloway um, and uh, Tony Scott, our former U.S. CIO, and Bill Cahoe, who is the CIO of L.A. County. I spoke to the current CIO of uh, Washington, uh, King County in the state of Washington, and several others within Amazon Public Policy, so maybe some of their feedback can come out today during our Q&A, Jim, and some of it's woven uh, throughout my remarks today. I'm also really delighted that Napa has partnered with the IBM Center for, um, oh gosh, sorry, sorry, IBM Center for the Business of Government. Is Dan Chenick here? I'm so sorry. Um, they are starting a project on agility. And uh, the idea here is they've laid out a set of principles around agility. Uh, that they're going to apply to various management operations. And the principles are spot on, and I'm going to talk about one in particular. Oh, good. Dan missed that. He just walked in. <laughs> I'm going to talk about uh, one principle in particular, and that is focusing on the customer and, and how it can help drive innovation in the government space. Before I get into that, um, technology is impacting our lives in lots of interesting ways. It's impacting people's dating lives. A lot of people have asked me um, <laughs> what it's been like moving into uh, Amazon from government. 
And the transition has been interesting on many levels. Um, one of the most challenging things to get used to is the dress code. So in government, uh, I used to wear black suits. I have a bunch of black suits. I wore them to nearly every event and every day to work. Um, now at Amazon, it's just a super casual uh, environment here. Uh, <laughs> and I've got uh, a flannel, flannel pajamas under there. Um, I, I was talking to Dan Tangerlini last night about should I come out today in like a hoodie, uh, black turtleneck and jeans, and he said, um, Elizabeth Holmes has ruined the black turtleneck for me. Um, and he said, you could uh, wear bare feet, but uh, the CEO of WeWorks has ruined that for you. So um, I started Amazon three years ago on Halloween, and so I was trying to figure out what was a costume or what was people's sort of everyday outfit. And I met my colleague, uh, Chris, who was wearing an Elmo costume. And I said, oh, that's really funny. Happy Halloween. And then uh, the next day, he was, he was wearing it again. So. Um, I had some great colleagues. Uh, many of you recognize Leslie Field, Matthew Blum. These are my colleagues now, um, <laughs> Waffle and Penelope. Um, they're not superimposed. These are real dogs at work. Amazon lets you bring your dog to work. I, I bring my dog every day. He sits under my desk and awkwardly barks at everyone that comes in, including my boss. <laughs> but, um, oh, and that's not me. I know it's a dead ringer, but um, <laughs> when I think about uh, government's attempts at innovation, I always think of the show Top Chef, where some really talented chef puts this amazing looking dish in front of the judges, and they say, um, this was amazing in concept, but really weak in execution, uh, and it needs more salt. And so that's the way I feel about some of the challenges around government innovation. And Bill Cahoe, who's the CIO of LA County, told me, you know, we want to innovate, but government is always lagging. So I wanted to talk a little bit about um, a principle behind how every technology company thinks about innovation. And it begins with a customer. And it's something I hadn't quite appreciated when I was in government. And I think this is an area where we consistently fall short. And um, we are very disconnected. When I say we, I always think of myself as a government person. So in government, we are very disconnected oftentimes from the customer, from the end user. When we think about launching anything innovative, whether it's a te technology or whether it's even a program, so, you know, Amazon, for example, spent a couple decades obsessing over how people buy. And they really thought through the customer experience from beginning to end to make an intuitive that you don't need training to actually understand this. Sorry. But, you know, you now take for granted things like one click shopping or seeing exactly the same information next to each other and being able to compare the products. So customer obsession is a leadership principle at Amazon. And it says leaders start with a customer and work backwards. And they work vigorously to earn and keep the customer trust. And it's not just words. It's deeply embedded in our daily jobs. So instead of beginning a project with maybe spreadsheets or um, complex numbers, we really look to understand the customer problem first. And so then we take a step backwards and we frame it in terms of what would a press release look like. So we create a one-page press release as if we're announcing the launch of that technology or innovation. And it's an incredibly challenging thing to do because you have to become crystal clear about the problem you're trying to solve and how you're going to solve it. And that is supplemented with a set of frequently asked questions, both internally for our leadership and externally for the customers. So it's called a PR FAQ. And every innovation project begins with a PR FAQ. It's taken to the leadership. And if it's deemed compelling enough, we're then told, go ahead and go launch it. So I want to give you a couple examples of how this works at Amazon. Um, new hire orientation is a classic working backwards process. So new hire orientation in government was a little bit painful, 
Uh, most of the time you sit in a room and you sign documents. Uh, I don't recall receiving any type of training. Um, when I was at OMB, uh, I went several months without a badge, so y you know what that's like to get in and out of the old executive office building without a full-time badge. Um, I didn't have a computer for several weeks. Amazon used the working backwards process for new hire orientation, and they thought about what is it that someone needs on their first day. And so I stood in a very small line, and in 10 minutes, I had a new picture, a badge, a laptop set up for me. And we went to a training, and the training was around customer obsession and customer service, and we actually listened to calls coming in from customers and Amazon's response. So I had everything I needed on my first day. I went back to my desk, signed into my laptop, and they had uh, all of these sort of wiki sites organized by um, day one, this is what you need to do, click here. It was a combination of video trainings and filling out a form, this is what you need on week one, this is what you need week two, this is what you need on your third month. And we do this for everything from onboarding new em employees to creating new features. Um, the process isn't perfect. Uh, Amazon didn't warn me about floating head syndrome. Uh, which happens when you wear a black turtleneck on your first day with a badge photo <laughs> when you have a black background. And so I thought it was funny for a while. And then I realized that every email you send has your photo at the bottom. And people started replying to my emails, very funny, floating head syndrome. Uh, and then after the second week, I just decided I couldn't take it anymore. So I went to the badge office and walked in and showed them my photo. And I said, oh, yeah floating head syndrome, no problem. And so I got it retaken with a white shirt. And so now everyone knows I have a torso, which is amazing. So uh, another great example is Amazon Go. And uh, the customer problem here was, uh, how do you solve for lines when people shop at grocery stores? And so they obsessed about um, their customers at Amazon Go for four years. And it's a store in which you walk in and walk out with no lines. Mm -hmm. And so like all customers at Amazon, um, the team set a very high bar for the customer experience. And um, think about all the complexity of the technology designed to support this. When you walk into the store, uh, they have to know who you are and they have to make sure they're charging the right credit card uh, and billing the right person. And they have to know exactly what it is you took off the shelf. Um, and if you put it back, they have to know you put it back. And if it's under another item in your basket, they have to still see it. Or if it's crowded, they have to still be able to accurately see that. Uh, and they walked the store as if they were the customer inventing all the various scenarios that one might have to undertake when walking into the store and leaving to ensure that it was the best customer experience. They started with uh, shelves in an office with a sort of clunky camera to really understand where this might be particularly challenging. It evolved into a beta or a test uh, at a store in Seattle where we tested it on our own employees first. Um, this was a quote from our first employee that went through there that it was a spiritual experience. Um, you can tell that was an Amazon employee because I'm, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure anyone else would think it was spiritual. But um, the New York Times had the best quote about Amazon Go, which was, it feels like, I can't say this any other way, like shoplifting. <laughs> So how do you apply this principle of customer obsession and working backwards in the government space? And so um, how do you systematically capture the voice of the customer every time you think about innovation? And there are so many challenges in the space I'm not going to even touch on today that our workforce policies and practices have to be much more flexible. Uh, we're enormously under-resourced in technology and government. You know this very well. Um, and so we pay enormous amounts of money um, just to maintain these old systems. And when you have old systems, then you need people with older skills to maintain them. And we have old classifications in the IT space. And I'm not going to touch on any of that. I'm going to let the super smart people in the room solve for that longer term. But I think there are things 
happening right now in government, lots of goodness around where we do obsess about the customer and there is innovation and I think we can capture that and help it to grow. Um, you know, the question is like, so how do we work backwards from this? <laughs> and so this is the famous, you know, DOD acquisition training chart. And somewhere on this chart, it apparently says it's best viewed in 3D because there are practices and policies not captured in two dimension. Um, but um, this is where uh, the process becomes the thing, right, in government. So they care more about the process than really the outcomes. It's, it doesn't feel like uh, an enormously customer-obsessed process. Um, so let me give you an example of where I think um, we can make a change, we can do it right now, and it's rethinking the role of the CIO um, in government. And we're better at this in some spaces than others, but uh, I think in many components of government, I mean this at all levels, local and state, uh, as well as federal, we oftentimes think of the CIO as the person that's going to approve your laptop purchase. Um, but Instead, they can help solve really important customer problems and be helping you think in a very strategic way. And Bill Cahoe, who's the former CIO of King County and the current CIO of LA County, spoke to me really eloquently about how historically, uh, over decades, the CIO in his older roles, he's not been invited to have a seat at the table um, to help solve customer problems. And when he moved into his role as uh, CIO of LA County, they have enormous problems uh, and challenges. And he uh, has moved into a role where it's strictly policy, it's not operational. So uh, they are open to him being there to help solve these problems. And so he met with all the leads of various programs in the county. And this is an example of one of the initiatives he is helping to solve, and this is the parking problem at the beach in LA County. And this is a typical day, and they have a very real problem where tourists and constituents are turning around after hours of searching for parking. It's an enormously painful problem for people. Uh, and they've received lots of voice of customer about it. And uh, Bill entered the scene by sitting down with the head of parking to say, I can help you solve this. Technology is not the answer to everything, but it's certainly an enabler. And he has been working with the head of parking on creating a digital parking program where you can see real time where there are parking spaces available and at the lowest cost. Um, Bill is also working with the director of the homeless program in LA County. So he met with the director who said, I've had so many technology companies approach me, offering me free technology, test it out, it'll help solve your problem. He was overwhelmed and not sure what to do with it. And Bill said, I will take the technology piece of this problem. And so Bill invited all his constituents, all the customers, which were the homeless, uh, community activists, academics, uh, people from government, uh, brought them all together in a room and laid out the biggest customer problems, the biggest challenges for them, came out with a list of 17 challenges, including lack of good data. Um, and he then crafted an RFI around the challenges. He received 53 responses from industry, which is unheard of. And when he brought them together in a room, um, they, they had breakouts around each one of the challenges. And now he's in the process of issuing an RFP around that. So this is something we can do now. And I know there's so many talented CIOs in the room right now that should be your strategic partners and not simply the person approving IT purchases. I think we can also reimagine industry partnerships. And this is funny now that I'm on the industry side of this. And uh, Dan Gordon, the former administrator of OFPP, wrote the famous Mythbusters memo, which industry still talks about today, which was a great memo in, in the sense that it really addressed a painful problem for industry that they felt like the communications was cut off to government. And um, Dan said sort of the light bulb moment came when he was talking to Vivek Kandra, the former CIO uh, for the federal government, who said, that, you know, the requirements are just too tedious for industry to really compete for these, and they're not written with the customer in mind. Uh, so that led to Dan's memo, and it's, it's made 
some headway, but it's still, we have such a long way to go in this space. And now that I'm on the other end of it, I still see agencies not doing debriefings when you put enormous time and resources into competing to an RFP so you don't understand why you weren't selected. Um, still unreturned phone calls, still very uh, confusing requirements. So. Um, there are ways and pockets of goodness where we can see industry and government working together. Um, this was, uh, there was an example of really the music industry and think about how the technology has changed in the last 20 years around music. It's all about streaming. And uh, the streaming services are eager to let their customers listen to all types of music, but really the licensing hadn't kept pace with the changes in technology, and there was a real impact on songwriters in ensuring they were collecting the royalties that they were due. Uh, and some of the companies, including Amazon, were being sued uh, because they weren't able to figure out um, who had the rights to that music, and so they stopped um, streaming some of it. And it was industry that came together to create this idea of a database that would be managed by the songwriters and others uh, to better track uh, uh, people's um, songwriting, uh, copyright. Um, the law that eventually passed was one of the few laws, I think, that has been fairly uncontroversial. And it was just something that hadn't changed in decades. And it was really industry that came and solved it um, with government. And uh, it's in the implementation, it's going to be a partnership between the, the streaming companies and government. The final thing I'll, I'll talk a little bit about is um, allowing a space for testing. So. Innovation really starts with testing, and, and we do lots of testing at Amazon, and uh, we do an activity called walking the store for any IT project, and walking the store is where we bring uh, together a group of people, even people outside of the uh, product that we're working on. And we have the exact experience of, in our case, walking our online store, and we do it under various scenarios, and it's not looking at PowerPoint slides and sort of imagining what that experience would look like. It's actually going online and becoming the user and saying, okay, I'm going to register. I'm going to, and we create scenarios. I am a uh, single user at a nonprofit and I'm trying to register at Amazon Business. And uh, everyone uh, gets pretty motivated on how bad the experience is uh, and starts yelling out things that are wrong with it. And we post yellow stickies on the wall. Um, and the key to the yellow stickies outlining the problem is they're not allowed to be technical descriptions. They have to be in the voice of the customer. So they have to say things like, I, I tried to click on this link and I just got a blank page. Um, and in the end, we have walls full of yellow stickies and then teams assigned to go fix that. And there are pockets of this really in government. Um, Department of Homeland Security under Soraya um, launched uh, Acquisition Innovation Lab. And uh, this was before our office came out with a memo encouraging all agencies to create these Acquisition Innovation Labs. And it's really the model in um, how you create the space for procurement officials to try new things. And they, uh, they badge some of their employees with digi badge badges um, based on a martial arts philosophy of beginner up to really the master. Um, they have webinars, they run boot camps, uh, they put over 35 acquisitions through this. And the key is that Soraya as a leader is willing to take the hit if something goes wrong, and she has. And so uh, it's a combination of sort of creating the space and the capabilities, but also having the leader like Soraya willing to, um, you know, uh, have the back of her employees, so to speak. And so this is something that uh, I know is happening in spaces throughout government, but really needs to happen more systematically before we launch any kind of innovation. So just in closing, I think, you know, we're the right people to be pushing the focus on the customer. It's a really fundamental principle of innovation. It's something um, pragmatic we can do. We have to consistently be asking ourselves, is government putting themselves in the shoes of the customer? Do we know what their pain points are? 
Um, so with that, I'm going to close and let Jim grill me, I mean, ask me questions. <laughs> so thanks so much. Well, thank you, Ann. And I think uh, I just want to make a few comments. First of all, I think what Ann is talking about is incredibly important. When you look at the grand challenges, and, and I've looked at these, while you have two technological challenges, what Ann is talking about, and at every federal agency, and, and Margie Gray is our deputy federal CIO, is here. She can tell you um, from her perch at OMB, is there an agency that's not involved in modernization, transformation, something that involves how do they deliver on their mission by modernizing the underlying technology, and how do you do that? And I, and I see different approaches all over. Dan Chenock, Bill Eggers, and, and about five other fellows are working on the IT systems panel to try and help the Social Security Administration modernize so that they can deliver better services. So I think this is just absolutely critically important as an underlying infrastructure to every one of these things. New approaches, advance, modernize, reinvigorate, all of these things are, are really dependent upon the technology and government is simply behind. And if we could push a button and say, yeah, we want to be like Mikey, we want to be like Amazon, we would all do that. Uh, and, but the, what Ann's delivered are some, some ways to get there. And, you know, she talked about uh, enhancing the role of the CIO, but listening to the voice of the customer, partnering with industry. And I guess, Ann, if, if I can grill you, uh, you've been on, you know, the, the side of all of these, the government, the in industry, the federal, the state. You know, what do you see as the impediments to getting there? And, and I don't see the CIO as talking to sorry, the Social Security Administration customers. I see that as somebody who runs a business of delivering those services, doing it. So how do you get government to really move to where you want them to go where they start to work backwards? Yeah, I think it's super easy. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, I was going to structure uh, today's remarks around, like, is government keeping pace with technology. And then I decided, well, that'll be a super fast speech. Uh, the answer is no. Uh, any questions? Um, but then, you know, it's the tougher space is, all right, OK, well, what's the solution? Like, how, how do we do it? Um, the impediments are all tied around these grand challenges. I mean, they all tie together. Um, you know, as I mentioned, like the workforce piece, the fact that we have older job classifications, the fact that you know, we do retrain people, but it's really difficult to move them into the new positions. Um, you know, it's hard to hire. It takes too long. Um, uh, yeah, Bill Cahoe at LA was talking about his job classifications are from 40 years ago. Um, there's, uh, I think it's Grant Thornton does the CIO, federal CIO survey every year. Uh, in one year, they were talking about the biggest, they identified the federal CIA as the biggest challenge to innovation is the culture, the risk averse culture. And when you dig into that a little bit, they define risk as um, trying a technology that hasn't been used before. So, uh, you know, in our space, we've had some success in Amazon business in working with governments to say, let's start with a pilot. <coughs> Um, and that gives the governments a sense of like, all right, this is a safer space for us and less risk averse. And we, we roll out very small and measured and, um, and so, uh, you know, take maybe one small office to begin and then expand over time. Um, you know, government is enormously under-resourced. Like, it, it takes a lot of courage to fight back against those who say, I'm not willing to fund technology, um, it's that simple. We have to make that investment. We can't keep paying for maintenance. Uh, but that's, that's a tough battle. Well, and, and the maintenance part is tough. I think people know in government, uh, and of the $450 billion that Ann used to oversee, what is it, 80 But not really control. <laughs> in fact, Stan Soloway, when I first started, I met with him when he was, where are you, Stan? Oh, yeah, uh, a professional services council, and he said, um, you do know, like, DOD is not going to listen to anything you say, right? <laughs> so, yeah, but anyway, yeah. But, but, you know, so much of that, a large percentage of that is information technology, which is, I think, where, you know, people are looking for that innovation and looking to, I think, more agencies are looking at the customer experience, customer journey, customer service, whatever you want to call it. 
And I guess, do you have any suggestions for how do you listen to the voice of the customer? When we look at places like VA, well, I, I, and I'm not trying to criticize anybody, they establish a veterans experience office, and then the veterans health says, we listen to our customers, we don't need you. Veterans benefit, we listen to your, our customers, we don't need you. And then you talk about which customers do you listen to? Do you listen to, you know, the, the female veterans, mm -hmm. the older veterans, the, you know, the new veterans? And, and then when you talk about benefits, you could look at, well, what are the benefit agencies? You know, if you're an American citizen, do you look at VA, IRS, SSA, CMS should all be listening to the customers so you get that singular voice of the customer? How do you do that? And you're at Amazon Business. You're not a single business. You're a lot of businesses. Mm -hmm. How do you actually engage the customer? Well, I think first in, in the government space, you have, you have to get crystal clear about who your customer is. And um, when I talked about this customer approach in front of um, a DOD procurement audience, uh, a young man said, I don't, I'm not really sure who my customer is. I feel like it's Congress because I was told to procure these, these planes, uh, this aircraft. And um, so I said to him, Congress is a stakeholder, and you very much have to understand how to work with Congress, but they're not your customer. Uh, your customer is the user of whatever it is you're procuring. And so your customer is the pilot. The customer is uh, the mechanic working on the plane. And it's not complicated on how you get that voice of customer. You actually just pick up the phone or go visit them. And we do, we do both of those. We, we pick up the phone and call our customers. We also systematically capture it um, by writing it down. And it's required to be in every document that we write. And so uh, you hear about the Amazon six pagers that we write around various, anything you want to launch as a six pager after the PRFAQ. Uh, and there always has to be a voice of customer section to it. You can be at a quarterly business review meeting with the muckety mucks of the company and they will ask you what is the voice of the customer and you have to have quotes off, on hand and be able to identify those customers. Um, I don't think it's that complicated. I think the hardest part for government is thinking about it and figuring out who it is. Well, I'm sure we can develop a process around this. Uh, I, I actually remember being at IRS when Charles Rosati came in and started calling taxpayers customers, and it was uh, very much rejected, you know, because taxpayers are obviously cheats. We just haven't caught them yet. Like, I don't think, um, you know, I know you're joking about processes, but I wouldn't be surprised if someone says, that's a good idea, let's develop a 10-step process. I think they but, um, but, sorry, um, it's, what I would suggest is, like, you need to build it into all your existing mechanisms. So, you know, your annual reviews, your, um, your, your, programmatic reviews, you should just build it into what's already there and you don't, it doesn't have to be overly complicated. You don't have to lay out how people should do it. You just literally pick up the phone. Well, and, and I think you're right. You have to listen to stakeholders like Congress, the oversight. I used to call them people could put a stake in your heart. Um, but you, know, you, you look at their customers, there's also the frontline employees. And when we recently, Dan and I met with some of the um, Social Security Administration, people who represent the front line, they really understood how the technology was failing to look like Amazon. And I don't know how you do that within Amazon. How do you also talk to your people who actually deal with the ultimate customers? Um, you're saying, what, sorry, what was the The employees yeah. who, who actually are on the front lines. Maybe if it's even your help desk people who hear what are the failings that they see, that they hear about, from their customers. And, and at the Social Security Administration, we got great feedback recently on where they see things are failing to help serve their constituents. They actually still have green screens. They said, we're fine when the green screens work, but the systems behind them don't work. And, and I think they gave us some interesting insights into the view of the customer from the view of the frontline employee. And, mm -hmm. I, and I would just suggest that, you know, do you do that? Do you collect things from your help centers from your frontline employees? Oh, yeah, yeah. We, um, we capture voice of customer through a number of different channels. One, the help desk, so that's all captured, every call. Um, and um, we also capture voice of customer just from the calls that our teams make, and it's input into a, a database. Um, we capture voice of customer from surveys. Uh, we 
have um, something that pops up every once in a while saying, how is your experience on Amazon? It's captured that way. It's all combined together so we can see what the top sort of pain points are for our customers and also the things that they think are working well. And then it usually requires a much deeper dive into really understanding when people say they have a problem with delivery, really understanding what failed there. And Amazon does the three whys around every problem. So you ask why three times. So it's not, you know, the, the box didn't show up because it said Friday instead of Saturday. Well, why did it say Friday instead of Saturday? Well, the system missed it. Well, why did the system miss it? And um, ultimately, uh, the company is really trying to get to the root cause and to see that you've actually implemented something that's going to fix the root cause and not just put a Band-Aid on it. But talking to the customers is an interesting thing, too, because our product teams are really eager to talk to you know, government users, but I always try to be the interpreter because I don't want them sort of, they need to understand that not everyone is a technology expert. The end users are not, in fact, technology right. experts. And it can be someone who really even struggles with an Excel spreadsheet, um, and like I do. And so, um, I think really trying to talk in the customer's terms uh, is important and not sort of go in with a series of technical questions that nobody could possibly answer. Well, I, th I think you know, if you look at Amazon, I assume <coughs> the obsession with the customer starts at the top. And you've yeah. been in a lot of government agencies. I don't know that you know that our cabinet secretaries talk about the customer experience and, and you know, put it in as part of the mission statement. I think some of them do. I, again, I came from the IRS and I think you all know our mission statement was, we've got what it takes to take what you got. Uh, <laughs> a wonderful place to work. But, uh, but I guess- I wasn't very, I mean, I wasn't good at it when I was in government. I didn't think about the customer when I was writing policies. No. I mean, I will say that, being vocally self-critical. You did a cost-benefit analysis and- Yeah, you know. right, 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 but, uh, yeah. But I wonder if you have any suggestions. I mean, government is right now trying to modernize very antiquated systems to, again, be like Amazon. And they don't want to get to one point and then say, OK, we've modernized. And then 10 years later, Margie knows all too well, there's a new effort to try and catch up again. And just wondering if you have any suggestions for how does government do that? And, and modernization in the government is very hard. I always say that, you know, that uh, God created the earth in six days, but he did not have to deal with legacy systems. And we have to modernize while that plane is in flight. So security has this problem. IRS has this problem. They have OPM has this problem. I don't know if you have a pension from there, but their system that runs our pension <laughs> is unbelievably old. I, mean, I think I, it predates COBOL. I hope to. Uh, I have a well, <laughs> but is there any suggestions for how does the government keep up as opposed to just looking to let's do innovation this year? We've done it. Let's do it again five years from now. How, how do you? keep the technology, keep the process, not the process, keep the f focus going so the government does keep up yeah, in the future. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure Margie has some thoughts on this too. I mean, I think uh, it's got to be done in the, using the agile approach of sort of in increments um, where you try to go fast and, and not overcomplicate it. And, um, you know, I think we have to transition away from these overly technical requirements that keep innovative companies out. Um, I'm seeing examples of this in my space where, you know, a team of people will write a requirement. It's so specific. And by the way, it is not customer friendly. And um, rather than just saying, here's what I want to achieve, you tell me how to actually, <laughs> what the technology will look like. Uh, you know, you have to fund these, you have to fund it. Um, and, 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 and again, it always, like, if you're going to try to modernize a system, please begin with the customer. Right. And so if you think about with healthcare.gov, if somebody had said, what is the customer experience that we're trying, you know, what is first the customer problem we're trying to solve? Let's build a technology around that. And then let's test it, and let's let's actually go through healthcare.gov as a user before we launch it. Um, I think we would have had different outcomes. Well, I, I know with that, uh, somebody who was involved in that said that the argument over requirements took so long there was very little time to actually develop, design, uh, and deliver. And by the way, I love your message on testing and anything you're developing that's new. 
my rule is always one quarter of the time has to be reserved for testing. Otherwise, you, you'll find out, you know, you, you can't get it right the first time, but you, there's always time to do it over again. Yeah. Uh, I also think, like, uh, when I think of healthcare.gov, like, you need a single-threaded leader. That is just a fundamental principle. And there are lots of leaders and not. Oh, sorry, louder? Yeah. Oh. It's funny, every time I move, I hear the static. Um, so my point was, in um, when I think about healthcare.gov, you need a single-threaded leader. And there were many leaders in that, um, and no one was held accountable. And it's sort of a fundamental principle, again, of technology and innovation. You have one leader, one person who's accountable. And that is a question that always comes up from my boss around any initiative we're working on. Who is a single-threaded leader? And I think what you're talking about is the government trying to take advantage of the private sector's best practices, best technology. And, and you've been in the acquisition system where that's usually the blame. Government, whether it's the DOD mission or anybody, can't keep up because the acquisition process is too long. Wondering, you know, why didn't you fix that uh, while you're there? Just yeah. kidding. Oh, um, but, yeah. no, I know. But, but yeah, in terms of the government being, being more agile, what are what are some of the key things the government should do to be able to move at the at the pace of technological change? Well, first of all, I you know I don't think that the rules and the regs are necessarily the blocker. I think um, it's your interpretation of those rules and regs. And so we do see people moving fast. Uh, we see examples of it in DHS's Acquisition Innovation Lab. They can show you they've cut down on the procurement lead time. <laughs> and so it's, it's, again, it's just it's doing it in an agile method, not trying to tackle it all at once. It's creating the space for it to happen. And it's also having a leader that's willing to put themselves out there and, and cover the team. And it's also an interpretation of the rules and regs in, in a way that it's a, it's a shift in the mindset, right? And so I see examples now of where we're in the government space where one person in government may say, um, there are regulations that prevent us from using you. And then there are others who say, no, it's absolutely acceptable. It's, there are no well, rules. I, I think there. also your, sorry to interrupt, but your message about engaging with industry and uh, the myth busting, and I was told it's myth busting because myth busters was trademarked, so it had to be myth busting. Oh, yeah. Yeah, a big I, problem I there. I probably said busters. So. Uh, it, it's quite all right, but I, I think you, you tried to engage industry and, and give cover to get the acquisition and program officials and everybody else to engage better with industry, yet I still think there's a long, long ways to go. And I, and I love the fact that DHS and their innovation lab is trying something new. When we tried to do this recently, and I, I'm not trying to you know, cast aspersions, but a, a big part of the um, intelligence community said, why don't you set up an innovation lab for acquisition? And believe it or not, there was resistance. Um, and it, it's amazing that people will resist pilots, as you said, try something new. And, and part of it, I think, Who is... Who resisted? I mean... I not, can't not, say. No, I don't mean people. I mean, in terms of, was it sort of rank and file? Or no. Was it, oh. No. But, but how do we get the government to try more, <laughs> to pilot, to, in, to test innovation? Uh, is, it a, is it a risk, fear of failure? Yes, it is a fear of failure. Um, you have to create the safe space, and it comes from the leadership. And um, it is perfectly acceptable to pilot and um, you know and you have to reward and you have to talk about it and uh, sorry to harp on DHS but I was reading through their their program last night they do an annual report and they highlight all the goodness happening in the lab and they give out awards and Soraya speaks about it and you need to get it I think you know when a government sees someone else their peers doing it it becomes much more acceptable and uh, so you have to get the word out, and then people feel like it's an acceptable practice. When it's untested, it's a risk. When they see other people doing it, it's less of a risk. Right. So it's, it's nice to see people like Soraya out there leading the way. Um, any other messages for fixing government? Again, <laughs> you've been at, at high levels of the federal, the state government. You're leading the, the government sector for Amazon business. You've seen it all. So if you're, you know, head of everything for the day 
what would you do? Well, I'm, so so it's interesting. Like I'm I'm torn because um, what I laid out are sort of pragmatic approaches, right? That you just and say like let's increase it dramatically. There's also the school of thought that says what it really takes is courage, a lot of courage from all of us to fight back over the fact that somewhere someone made a decision the government is not going to be the innovators it's going to be the private sector and we've turned it over to the private sector essentially and said government's going to do just sort of keep things going but we're going to turn to industry to solve all the problems and be perceived as the innovators and we need to have the courage to say we have super talented people in government they need the resources they need the training they need the they need to be empowered and there's about 85 things that go into making them empowered to make government the innovators again, because there are pockets of it, and there are super smart people here, um, and uh, you know, government has many examples of where they've been the innovator. But I feel like the table has turned. Well, I think modernization has been a key element of of the current president's management agenda. It was of the last administration. It will continue to be so, and. Yeah, you know, I, I don't know with, you know, the CIO you've talked about as making them enhance their role. On the other hand, you know, people in some situations say the business should be driving this because it is really you have to change the technology, the process, the people. Yeah, so No, you need a single-threaded leader. And in most cases, if you're trying to solve homelessness, it is the, the program lead. But the CIO is the enabler and the partner and the strategic partner and has to be at the table. Which means, again, I always use my Leslie Nielsen line, Margie, good luck, we're all counting on you to make this happen. Yeah, you uh, need Margie at the table, always. Well, I think she's, she's one of those innovative CIOs who's willing to listen to industry, try new things, and for both the Department of Homeland Security now at OMB. Um, and I guess, you know, looking at innovation, I don't remember that really ever being part of my SES expectations, and I think you're saying we've got to start building that into the recognition, reward systems, everything, right? Yeah, I mean, whatever you call it, um, it's just trying to keep pace with technology, and um, yeah, it has to be built into every single component of government operations, into the performance reviews, into the documents that you write to launch a program, into the program reviews. Um, and it's, I, it's not complicated, but it does require a major shift in, in reimagining of how we do things. Well, I like the idea of a government agency trying to build a program around the launch of a press release. That would be an interesting example. It is a really hard exercise ah. to do. <laughs> because it's not sort of like, hey, we're launching a, you know, a new software app. This is great. It's, no, no, no. What, what is, what is the app? What problem is it solving for the customer? And what would the customer say when they use it? And what exactly are the features? The press release doesn't get in great detail, but it has to have enough in there that you can very clearly understand what it is that this app or whatever product you're releasing. Well, and I, I think whether you're talking about modernization, transformation, or any of the grand challenges, you've offered some incredible uh, ideas, best practices, lessons learned. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you. Thanks, All right, we really appreciate Anne, you offering those insights. Um, and Anne didn't wear a pin, but you all know that she is a Napa fellow yeah. too. So uh, we, we pan, really, <laughs> we, we should have given you one at the desk. Um, we are going to clear the room so that they can set it up for lunch. Don't go far, right? Because we want you to come right back. We do still have a couple of things left. We have a lunch speaker and really an important award to present. So we're gonna take about 10, take your stuff, and then come back. Thanks again. <laughs>